Welcome and bienvenue. I am Andrea Davis, an associate professor in the Department of Humanities in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies at York University. I am also the academic convener for Congress 2023, which will take place at York University next year. On behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, I'm delighted to welcome you to the fourth and final Big Thinking event at this 91st Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences. Today, Dr. Imra Zeman and Sheena Wilson will give a presentation titled Petrocultures, Reflections on 10 Years of Research and Advocacy for a World in Crisis. Today's event will take place in English and American Sign Language ASL. We have also included French simultaneous interpretation and closed captioning in English and French. An ASL interpreter should appear on your Zoom screen. To access simultaneous interpretation, please go to the bottom of your Zoom screen where it says interpretation. To turn on English closed captioning, please navigate to the bottom of your screen and click on the closed captioning button. You may also find this button under settings. For French closed captioning, please click on the link provided in the Zoom chat box. This information will appear again in the chat during the event for those joining us later. As this event is virtual and we're not all gathered in the same space, I invite you to take responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. I'm speaking to you today from York University. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Tikaranto's intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous peoples from other territories, as well as white settlers and those people who have come here by force or otherwise as a result of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and ongoing wars. As a descendant of Africans formerly enslaved in the Americas who were taken from their ancestral lands against their will, I am committed to what Tiffany King calls a notion of mutual care. And I recognize that a future for Black peoples is not possible without a future for Indigenous peoples by whose leave I live, walk on, and share this land. I acknowledge finally that these Americas are built on violence and erasure, and we bring these histories with us when we enter any room, any virtual space, and we must bring them into view. With this knowledge of history, we enter here in the hope of making a different world. The Big Thinking series at Congress brings together leading scholars and public figures to address some of the most pressing questions of our time. It is our great honor to welcome both of our speakers today. Dr. Imra Zeman is the University Research Chair of Environmental Communication at the University of Waterloo. He is the author, most recently, of On Petrocultures, Globalization, Culture and Energy, and is currently working on The Future of the Sun, a book detailing corporate and state control 
of the transition to renewables. He's also the climate critic for the Green Party of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Dr. Sheena Wilson is a professor of media, communications and cultural studies at the University of Alberta. Her publication highlights include Petrocultures, Oil, Politics, Cultures with Imre Zeman and Adam Carlson, Trafficking in Petronormativities and Energy Imaginaries, Feminist and Decolonial Futures. With York University Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies Professor, Dr. Angel Aluk, she co-directed Pico Pine, It Is Broken, a documentary film created as part of a partnership between Just Powers and Big Stone Cree Nation. She also advises Edmonton's municipal government on energy and climate. Today, Dr. Zeman and Dr. Wilson, together, Dr. Zeman and Dr. Wilson founded Petrocultures, an international research group that is organized around the social, cultural, and political impacts of our current energy system, namely oil and fossil fuels, and what it means to transition away from that system. Following a video presentation by Dr. Zeman and Dr. Wilson, we will be joined by Dr. Zeman E. Howe, Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Anthropology at Rice University. Dr. Howe currently researches socio-natural transformations of ice in the Arctic and the impacts of sea level rise in coastal cities around the world. Dr. Howe will moderate a discussion with Dr. Zeman and Dr. Wilson. They will take a few questions from the audience you can submit your questions by typing them into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. You can also participate in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Big Thinking and Congress, Congress with an H at the end. On behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, I would like to thank the sponsors for the Big Thinking at Congress 2022 series, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, Universities Canada, and the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will now turn to a video presentation by Dr. Zeman and Dr. Wilson. Bonjour and hello. My name is Sheena Wilson, and I am joining you from Amiskwichi, Wiskaigan in Treaty 6 territory. The University of Alberta in Edmonton is situated on lands long ago stolen from Papas Chase and Métis peoples, displacing them through means and methods that have led to the loss of culture and lives that's part of our nation's history of genocidal practices. Energy and natural resources have played and continue to play a starring role in this history. As we talk about petrocultures today, it's important to say that whether they are oil and gas, or renewables, all energy projects happen on the land. It's with this awareness that my colleague Imra Zeman and I speak to you all today. Imra, would you like to introduce yourself? I wish to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. It's the 10th anniversary of the Petrocultures Research Group this year. I'm wondering, do you remember, how did it come about? How did it come about? Well, you know, I remember it pretty much like it was yesterday. In some ways, it's hard to believe everything that's happened in the last 10 years. It's so good to see you, by the way, and thanks to everyone who's listening in. But yeah, what do I remember? I mean, I remember that you had arrived at the University of Alberta, I think in like, what, 2010, 2011. Several people had mentioned your name to me and said that we should meet. You were in the Faculty of Arts at the time as a Canada Research Chair, and I'm at Campus Saint-Jean, the Francophone campus at the University of Alberta, so we hadn't crossed paths, but we clearly had shared interests. So we eventually met at Leva Cafe, if you remember, just off the University of Alberta campus. And me, being from Treaty 6 territory, I was born here and raised here, but I also come from a family largely settled in Northern Alberta, and I have lots of family and friends and kinship relationships of all varieties up there. 
And since about 2005, I've been working on issues largely related to the tar sands. Actually, there were documentary films coming out. I was in conversation with several women activists, quite a few of them, Indigenous women activists organizing the tar sands healing walks. Um, Eventually, some of them would become part of Idle No More that I was in conversation with. You and I met and we talked about our shared research interests. We talked about how hard it was to find out what was going on because in some ways so much was going on but not so much from the perspective that we were thinking through. By the end of the coffee date, I think we'd settled on the fact that we could really use a listserv of some kind or a clearinghouse so that we could figure out what was going on and share with other people what was going on. So we decided on that. We said, let's have a workshop and get together and think together with other people interested in this. And I was already editing a special issue of a journal that was eventually called Citing Oil that actually became a big part of the first conference. And so we said, well, we have the the perfect trifecta. Let's apply for a grant. We just met. And I also remember that by the end of the coffee date, we decided to call it Petrocultures. I guess since we're going to be talking about that for the next 30 minutes, maybe we should explain to everyone, you know, how we understand that term. As the name suggests, it's a culture shaped by and in relation to energy and specifically our current dominant form of energy which is oil, fossil fuels. The collective work of petrocultures has been mobilized by a simple insight, that there's a deep link between the energy on which society depends and its cultural, social, political, and spatial form and character. It's a critical realization that the different fuels on which we've been dependent don't only power our society. I guess what I'm trying to say there is that various kinds of fuels, they're not just inputs into our society, that don't have any real impact on social political phenomenon that would have taken the same historical path of development regardless of the specific kind of energy used. Okay, so we're not saying it's just an input. Rather, the idea of petrocultures draws attention to the fact that energy plays an essential and fundamental role in shaping social, political, and cultural life, in shaping who we are, and where we live and what we are. Especially since the mid 19th century, changes in the forms of energy that we've used have altered what we're capable of, how we imagine ourselves and the spaces we inhabit. Just for instance, the structure of our transportation systems, the shape and design of our cities, the expansion of global trade and the nature of warfare. All of these are linked to the ease of access and affordability of fossil fuels, which has created durable structures that we're going to have to repurpose in a post-oil future. But it's not just these physical structures we've been interested in. And I think this is key for what understanding what petroculture specifically brings to a discussion about contemporary culture and its relation to energy. It's not just physical structures that we'll have to change. There are other structures we have to reshape working together which are more difficult to grasp and grapple with than these kind of visible material constructs, all those visible material constructs of petrocultures, suburbs, highways, and so on. There are other things that are more difficult to grasp that we have to work on. We need to contend with the psychological, the affective, and the political dimensions of petroculture, which were developed in relation to the ever-expanding use of fossil fuels values and ways of being we associate with being modern, things like individuality, autonomy, freedom, self-development, progress, and social and economic growth. I remember the historian and cultural critic Deepesh Chakrabarti saying something to the effect that the mansion of modern freedoms is built on an ever-expanding Um, access to fossil fuels. So in fact, what we imagine as contemporary democracy has at its core fossil fuels, if in a, if in a complex way. In petrocultures, what we're trying to do is figure out all of the ways in which our expanded energy use via fossil fuels, um, in particular post World War II, when it really went up dramatically, but also since the discovery of fossil fuels in the mid 19th century. Um, Does that seem right, Sheena, uh, to you? Maybe it would help if 
you gave us an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about here. One of the best examples of energy defining the petroculture is automobility, right? So to be modern is to be mobile as never before. And part of this mobility is really the culture of automobility. So the automobiles had a profound impact on social life because in the West, and increasingly so actually around the world, but in the West, it's really become a necessary tool for independence and the successful management of, you know, getting from work to home, the management of the nuclear family, and the nuclear family itself has become so intrinsic to the neoliberal construction of personal success. So when I say that I, I talk about the development and maintenance of the nuclear family as the accepted norm for how we're supposed to live together, and the ways that women and men must independently reproduce household tasks over and over and over again, tasks that could have been socioculturally developed collectively or in other ways, and relieved families of so much reproductive work. So the mobility and housing needs of the nuclear family have shaped the design of urban and suburban living in petrocultures, just as the number of consumer goods that we buy shapes the marketplace, and then we just accept this, right, in advertising and film, there's a really non-critical sociocultural acceptance of the automobile as a sign of individual freedom. So mobility being part of the construction of a petro-capitalist society and other fossil fueled machines means that if we shift to another power source, that doesn't automatically mean that we're shifting our ways of living and being. So take the electric car, for example. It promises a low carbon mode of travel, so lots of people assume it's a way to transition from petroculture to something else, right? But is it really? I mean, I argue that it's not. In a recent article called Traffic and Petronormativity, I talk about the need for what I call deep energy literacy. And deep energy literacy really means the ability to assess energy transition strategies for more than just their ability to decarbonize, but for their ability to really address the root causes of the current climate crisis, which are, which are about extractivism and exploitative ways of seeing and relating to others on the planet. So taking up the example of automobility again, deep energy literacy is about seeing beyond the fuel source to the social relations that need to be remade. So regardless of whether the vehicle is powered by fossil fuels or renewable, electri renewable electricity, like, you know, let's say you have solar panels on your roof fueling, you know, the the electric charger in your garage, automobility retains all of the connections I've just spoken about around mobility and independence and the nuclear family and capitalism and of course colonization because roads are one means of colonizing these stolen lands that we now call Canada. Vast networks of residential roads and freeways and highways, they colonize space, they disrupt ecologies, they create urban and suburban sprawl. So they also colonize the ideology that organizes our way of living together. Modern ideology would have us erase the collectivity of urban life by, you know, replacing it with this notion that we're all so independent. I think about how in my city there's so many complaints about potholes that really sum up the tensions between the reality that we all live together and the fiction that we're all independent and self-made, right? And it's kind of humorous. So all to say that the electric car might make things happen on one level, at the level of decarbonization, you know, there's less greenhouse gases produced and all of that. But unfortunately, electric vehicles impede change at another level because they reinforce our desire for the individual forms of mo like mobility that we've developed as fossil fueled creatures. They allow the infrastructures of our cities to stay very similarly organized around cars instead of people. They allow us to sustain the infrastructures of our social fantasies. So the Western Enlightenment fantasy that we're autonomous and self-made and the narrative of fossil fueled modernity is so destructive at so many levels. So even if we become renewably fueled moderns, we haven't really addressed the root causes of climate change. We won't really have transitioned all that much. And you know, I have to say the degree to which the electric car has been so widely accepted as a sign and symbol of the renewable era by governments and politicians, but also because it's sort of what citizens can handle right now, doesn't really do too much to disrupt the petrocultural status quo. There's one other point I'd like to add, if that's okay. Um, the process of a century and a half of what our friend and colleague Jeff Diamanti has called energy deepening, which means 
the way in which fossil fuels get stuck deeper and deeper and still deeper into our lives. This process of energy deepening, it makes us difficult for there to be a quick transition from fossil fuel society, even if there was a quick change in the kind of fuel we use. To take your example of the electric automobile, you know, if there was somehow a possibility to switch immediately from fossil fuels to, let's say, solar energy or other kinds of renewables, much of global society would nevertheless still be a fossil fuel society because its values and beliefs are tied so deeply to the energies provided by oil, gas, and coal. That's part of why we find ourselves at present stuck in an impasse with respect to climate change. You know, moving too slowly in terms of policy, because moving faster, I think, means we have to become different kinds of creatures, both individually and socially, and in a fundamental way. Social change of the kind demanded by climate change, it can feel threatening and uncertain. One of the dominant narratives in current climate change discourse, it relates to hopes that new technologies like blue hydrogen or carbon capture utilization and storage, that these new technologies, the ones in fact promoted in the current federal budget um, as a way of addressing Canada's deferred uh, CO2 levels um, in relationship to the Paris Agreement, there's this hope that these new technologies will make social change unnecessary by managing the outcome of our practices rather than changing the practices themselves. All of us looking at petrocultures are interested in understanding better the social narratives and practices that have blocked a recognition of the need to become different kinds of energy subjects and a different kind of energy society, which is driven by different imperatives and outlooks. We've been interested in mapping those narratives and practices uh, that have tried to model the ways we might change from fossil fuel subjects into truly renewable creatures, renewable beings. So much exciting work has come out of the research associated with petrocultures. And it all begins with that exciting first conference, really. Um, Sheena, can you, can you remind me what that first conference was like? Um, my memory is not that good anymore. Well, that first conference for sure, I mean, the major takeaway was that um, we were going to organize a workshop. I think we imagined it would be half a day and, you know, we'd do some thinking together and with some other people and we put out the call and I think initially we got about 150 responses and then they just kept coming in even after we had made our selections and they came in from all over the world. And when everybody came together, there was just real magic in the air because everybody had felt as though they were doing this work on their own, the only person in their department, the only person in their faculty, the only person in their discipline at the conferences they were going to. And suddenly there was, you know, we tapped into this zeitgeist and there was all of this excitement and enthusiasm. So that was a really big takeaway. There's still so much to do when it comes to understanding and understanding deeply how we've been made into energy creatures, into petro subjects living in a petro society. That's why Petrocultures has given birth to so many other projects related to the original set of issues that we've been looking at but maybe slightly different angle to it. Can you tell us about the one uh, you've been working on, uh, Sheena? You've been kind of leading the development of the project called Just Powers. So Just Powers is a project that grew out of petrocultures. It is funded by SHRC and by the Future Energy Systems at the University of Alberta, which is a Canada First Research Excellence Fund. And it's a project committed to intersectionally feminist and decolonial anti-racist approaches to climate justice. And people sometimes say, well, why energy transition? Why is that the focus? And that's been the focus for just powers, but also for petrocultures, because, you know, addressing energy transition has been declared as one of the first necessary steps to deal with climate change, mm -hmm. right? So then if we deal with energy systems, as we've already mentioned energy systems shape our societies our communities 
our relationships, the power, the power dynamics that grow up around them. But it's not like oil is necessarily inherently bad or a solar infrastructure is necessarily inherently good. And so, uh, you know, you have to think meaningfully about what kinds of relationships and relationships of power we want to cultivate around new energy systems. Um, so for many years, I've been working with this theory of deep energy literacy, and it actually came about out of IDOC, this idea that energy literacy was very, very popular there for a while. And people felt you had to understand the technical aspects of energy, how it functioned, how we were using it in order to transition. But, you know, deep energy literacy is understanding those deep political, extractive, relational modes of being in the world that created the, the current problem, right? So for me, climate change is just one symptom, one crisis caused mm. by this extractivist worldview. So, you know, we, we had IDOC, which is an intermediate documentary project that I already mentioned. I interviewed over a hundred different kinds of influencers, I would say, in the energy sphere, energy researchers, activists, policymakers, indigenous legal experts, elders, all sorts of different people that brought different situated knowledges to, to the situation. And we have other projects too. Speculative Energy Futures is a major pillar project under Just Powers. And that one is really about research creation, working together, creating interdisciplinary relationships, not to produce art as a final outcome, but really mobilizing artistic methods. What my co-lead on that, Natalie Loveless, talks about as research creation in her recent book. I think we've always been really committed on petrocultures to you know, different forms of, of knowledge creation different ways of knowing and different ways of mobilizing knowledge to reach broad audiences because policy impact is one way to measure change, but there are lots of stories that are told before there's a policy change, right? Change is incremental, you know, and then I worked with Big Stone Cree First Nations. So I should give a shout out to Angela Look who created the film, It Is Broken. And, you know, we worked together on that for a number of years with her community. And those are just a few, like a handful of the projects, right? Running energy transition projects in the French Quarter with community members. Everybody's engaged. Everybody's consulted with. And, you know, this is the thing that the knowledge is emerging, iterative, and locally specific. And um, sometimes people want the solution to climate change. They want you to tell them, so what can I do? But actually, that is not how we're going to solve for this problem because that creates a kind of eco-fascism as though people are coming in with the answer, right? In each of these contexts, these are hard, unwieldy problems. So we're wrestling with them collaboratively and in community and across communities. And, and so that's some of the work we've, we've been doing. But, you know, why don't you tell everybody about um, After Oil? I think some people know about the After Oil project and would love to hear how it got started and where we're at recently, because we've just had a, another collaborative book published. I, I'd, be, I'd love to talk about it. We've done two of these things called after oil schools. I really regret calling it after oil to begin with because now we'll have repeated after oil schools and that's not kind of not really after oil anymore. Uh, they're about transition. They're about, uh, the first one was about uh, focusing on, on transitions away from oil. The second one was about transitions to solar and what that might look like. Um, and we're coming back to something that we were talking about early about unique ways of producing knowledge, which is something that happens in Just Powers as well. This was at the heart of the idea of the After Oil Project. Um, we kind of thought like, you know, instead of everybody, we were, we were reading a lot of things and they were kind of saying the same basic points. Um, I thought, let's get, let's get everybody together and everybody should lay their cards on the table. And so instead of each writing individual essays that we would share at an event, let's come and we're going to write something together, a single book together. And we did it. The first after oil school took place in August, 2015. There were 35 of us. Um, it included a former politician in Alberta, artists, activists, and academics as always. And over three solid days of working, maybe four, um, we wrote the uh, draft of a book. That book has since come out as this short book called After Oil. It's easy to find PDFs of it circulating around. It's also in book form. That was written by the After Oil Collective. 
And it, this book has come to be treated, I think, as one of the founding texts of energy humanities because it's this book where we lay it on the table. Here's what's at stake in addressing the significance of a petroculture, undoing its impacts and its effects, and then giving us some clues and some codes about where we're going to go next. So if I didn't learn my lesson the first time around about um, getting a bunch of people together to write a book, over a few days, my colleague Darren Barney at uh, McGill University has also been very important to petrocultures. He enticed uh, me and my colleague Mark Simpson at the University of Alberta to help him stage a second after oil school. So at the second event, uh, which was held in 2019, I believe, um, in conjunction with the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal. I think the final number, uh, Sheena, was 70 people we brought together. Uh, and we gave ourselves only two days. I don't understand what we were thinking. Um, and again, we are tasked with producing a single book with a single voice over time, of course. And we came up with something. And it has just been published by the University of Minnesota Press, and it's called Celerities. Given how quickly we need to act on climate change, how quickly we need to make a genuine energy transition happen, one that's informed by justice and, and new forms of collectivity that's truly political, um, I think we have to keep doing the kind of work that Just Powers is doing and that uh, this, this sub-project of petroculture is called After Oil is doing. I mean, I think one of the things that we have done in interesting ways is respond to the challenges that, you know, Shirk put out there two or three decades ago to be interdisciplinary, you know, and then the grand challenges we've really, you know, worked in collaborative and innovative ways. And certainly there are other adjacent research groups doing interesting things, but I think the way we're um, working collaboratively and building knowledge and breaking down disciplinary silos and building up new um, ways of integrating knowledge, I think are also a really important legacy of the first 10 years of the Petrocultures Research Group. So all I can say is that it's an open invitation to anyone who's interested. You know, Petrocultures, it was really an invitation. And, you know, two of us alone could have done none of what has happened, right? It really took off and um, you know, that, that is really because of everybody that's part of the, you know, the Petrocultures Research Group, whether it's the 60 core members or the hundreds of people across the planet uh, doing this kind of work and showing up at the events and, and submitting and contributing and thinking together with us. So that's fantastic. It's been a real ride. So what do you think is next? Somebody told me that this might be the time for a new logo, that this might be perhaps even a time to rename the organization. I think that we have to kind of keep the legacy of the moment of our origins. And I, I think people know that we're not kind of committed to there being a constant uh, petroculture. <laughs> but what else? Um, I know for me, it's there are uh, two directions that, that are important. One of them are, is to try to make the connections between the research that we're doing within this organization and the activities uh, carried out by policymakers specifically. This is a challenge, of course, but it's, it is crucial for those policymakers to be uh, informed about the ideas that we have about energy and about the ways in which energy is deeply sedimented into our social ways of acting and, and, and believing and, and uh, being. Um, it's not part of the discussion that happens at policy levels. Still too much about numbers. Like you, I do policy advising and I advise, you know, committees and council about ways they could think differently. And when everything's going fine, people are willing to take that on and wrestle with these complicated issues. But a lot of times it comes down to the bottom dollar or old decision making practices and people fall back on what they know, even when we know what we know and how we're doing it is broken. And so I guess it's just about continuing to do the work and saying some of the same things again and building our knowledge, but also I think giving ourselves permission to fail. Not every experiment is going to succeed. Not every experiment has to be, you know, translatable to another context. Some of them will be locally specific. Not every, every solution will be scalable, 
I think we just have to keep having those conversations and allow for failure and allow for redirection. I mean, all we can do is transition with the technologies we already have. This is what I learned from the scientists. Any technologies under development at best are going to take eight to 10 years to be on the market. 2030 is eight years away. We don't have a lot of time to wait for new tech, to wait for the next generation of solar. And I think that we really need to think about what we value now. So policy and science, but always with the understanding that the one thing that we can change are those soft infrastructures, the social, political, economic relationships that really are of our own creation. And we can do that. They're the hardest changes in some ways, but we can do that if we have a collective will. So I guess it's about continuing to have those hard conversations and, and seeing where they take us and listening well. Here's, here's to 10 more years. Here's to 10, 10 more years. Yeah. How many more years do we have till 2050? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to you, Imra, and thank you to all of our colleagues in the Petrocultures Research Group and After Oil and Just Powers and all the enormous amounts of intellectual and other forms of labor that have gone into um, making all the discoveries and creating all the knowledge we've, we've managed to accumulate this far, and it's been pretty fantastic. And thanks to Shirk, I suppose, who funded quite <laughs> since thanks. we're speaking in their series. Yeah. Thanks to thanks to you, Sheena, and thanks to everyone who's been along for the ride. Sheena and Imra, thank you so much for this presentation. It was so informative and also so impressive to see what you've been doing over the last decade or so. And I wanted to also reach out to our audience now to say that we will have time for questions. So please begin thinking if you haven't already about the questions that you would like to pose uh, to Imra or Sheena. Again, this was just a super compelling story and I loved hearing the origin stories of After Oil. I loved hearing about Just Powers and the Petrocultures Research Group. And really all you've been able to do both in a critical space as well as a productive intellectual space. But it also, seems, and we hear this in the presentation, that we do have a long way to go. And so maybe some of our audience questions will, will pose those sorts of uh, questions to us also. I wanted to start out uh, by asking you, Sheena, if I can direct this question to you. You point out in the presentation how deeply settler colonialism has been imprinted in these spaces and places, and how petrocultural living is a key and component part of that story. And we see examples like land seizure, automobility, how those are taken for energy production. I'm curious to hear though, do you see other links between petrocultural life, petrocultural histories, and the toxic relations that infect our society today in addition to settler colonialism. And here I'm thinking of the dynamics of, of sexism and racism, but the, the list could go on. Are there ways in which petroculture continues to offer toxic relations to us all? Thanks for the question, Simone, and thanks for being here. Um, I mean, the, the short answer is yes. I see that everywhere, right? That what we really need to do um, we really, you know, the, the, the problem isn't climate change or the need for energy transition. Really the problem is those extractive relationships that are at the foundation of modern life. Kind of the denial of the body, the denial of the land, um, the denial of some bodies more than other bodies. So I think we can see it everywhere we look, right? Efficiency is kind of the antithesis of recognizing our humanity. This drive for no redundancy means that we're not going to be very resilient in the face of any kind of onslaught, whether that's an onslaught from, you know, well, I think here in Alberta of the, the education system, the post-secondary education system and the onslaught there through, you know, basically seizures of funding so that we're all less educated and less able to think critically about these root causes and root problems in our society that are really what we need to address, right? By addressing the injustices in society, we will address climate change. 
because those those are at the core of the problem, right? The reverse is not true. If we if we decarbonize, it won't really do anything for all of these injustices. So we have to think about them simultaneously. So yeah, yeah thank I, you for the question. Yeah, I think it's really important that that acting simultaneously, right? Recognizing that injustices beget other injustices, and that it's tied up into these into these fossilized relationships. So I think it's fundamental. And as we're imagining resilience, often it's used in terms of environmental resilience, but it's just as pertinent that we have human resilience. So that's why I think the work that, that you've been doing has been so important, especially in addressing these kinds of injustices. Yeah, I just, I think one other thing is that I, I hear people often say, well, we just really need to take action on these things and we can worry about injustice later. But that's not how systems are created and that's not how it works right right so, yeah exactly idea exactly mm -hmm. imra i have a question that i wanted to point in your direction also you mentioned in the presentation that we need to become different kinds of energy subjects uh, and to imagine a different kind of energy society that's that's driven by different imperatives different outlooks and how, how your work has been sort of mapping those narratives and practices and potentials, I would say. And you talk about modeling the ways that we might change from fossil fuel subjects into truly renewable creatures. I really like this concept, truly renewable beings. So I want to ask you, Imra and Sheena, if you wanna follow up on this too, what might we look like as post petro subjects? And how do you see the shape of society and persons living within these societies changing as we morph and transform into hopefully a post-petro subjects? Always the easy questions uh, at the beginning, but thank you, Simone. Um, I think there are some hints of it that other um, thinkers have given us already. One of them has to do with the, the nature of the day. So if we are to rely on the power of, of the sun and the wind, um, it means that we might not be able to have nine to five lives. It means that we might have to become accustomed and indeed we might celebrate the chance to do other things instead of work when the clouds come in or the wind dies down. Um, of course, the narrative continues that we will overcome those problems by virtue of bigger batteries or by other kinds of technological solutions. But I suppose what I've been trying to argue is that we should celebrate those changes. Because I can't say that um, this society seems very healthy the way that it is. And I don't think that many of us in it um, enjoy living in it or celebrate living in it. Certainly, we don't like the impact that we make on the environment. We don't like what the future looks like being the way that we are and how we imagine um, the, you know, how, what, what it looks like we're going to be in the world. So whatever it is that we're going to do along with energy transition, we should have a discussion about what other kinds of social transitions we want to undertake. And a lot of that, I think, means about changes to the day. Um, I think as well, there's a sense and sense, there's a sensibility that we have to cut back, we have to go into a kind of a degrowth, we have to make sacrifices in order to live with different forms of energy. And I, I don't like that language. I think that that is only true if we still imagine having lots of energy in the way that we have been, so that there's always a compromise with not using as much. In fact, I would say that trying to puzzle out how we might live with different forms of energy already gives us a sense of how else we might live. It's still something in, in progress. It's still something that's unfolding. And I suppose what I'm trying to figure out now in my recent work is where the openings are to allow that to happen, but also what's standing in the way, because there's a very, very deep, it, the status quo has an interest to keep things as they are, even if we move to a, new, a renewable society. But Sheena, I'd love to hear your ideas as well. Well, and I think from the beginning, we, we've talked quite a bit about these things. And I, 
I also, you know, try to provide similar messaging to students and to communities when I work with them and just say, you know, let's meaningfully think about what we actually like about this time period, this, you know, age of oil. What are some of the benefits and what isn't actually so great? And what would we want to change? Because I think actually transitioning to other ways of living could be so much better than how we're living now that the response that it will somehow be lesser is, you know, a really fear-based response, but there are other ways to think about what it means to transition and what we're transitioning to, right? There are vested interests in making us think we're transitioning to a lesser than model, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like that exercise. I hope I can borrow it from you <laughs> to, you know, to sit with students and with others and community members and really ask the question, what do we really appreciate what makes us thrive in this context, this fossil fueled context? What do we want to preserve without those mechanisms um, to, to live very fulfilling lives? And then what would we rather leave behind? Because there is a lot of detritus to leave behind. Um, I have another question here from the audience I'd like to pose. And that is, how do we maintain public attention and focus on climate change even during other crises I'll let you fill in the blank as to what that crisis might be, COVID-19 being one of them. Um, how, do we, how do we sort of move forward on climate action while also attending to these other very dramatic and catastrophic situations? Sure, if you don't mind, Sheena, I'll, I'll jump in. One, what I think is fascinating about the moment that we're living through is that we have a sense that there isn't a lot being done on climate change. And at the same time, it's front page news. It's something that governments have to deal with in a way that hasn't been the case, wasn't the case even 10 years ago. So when we have a crisis like COVID, or I would say the current war in Ukraine, it does get figured very quickly in relationship to climate change or to, to energy. And we can learn from that about what, what we might want in these changes. So from COVID, I think what stands out to me is this realization that even with a lot of the practices that we normally do in our kind of common everyday life, um, we keep, we, lack of air travel, less use of all kinds of energy, uh, reduction in global trade, um, we didn't really cut that much um, use of energy out of our system which tells us about how much, we, how much work we have to do. Indeed, kind of into the second year of COVID, we were right back where we started from and the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere continues to increase. So I would say that that crisis actually gives us something to hold on to. And I think it's true of the war in Ukraine as well. There is immediately this rush to decide on the part of some governments that what we need is a lot of fossil fuels. But that produces a, kind of a pushback. Um, there is then a discussion about the, that maybe what is best for geopolitical safety on the part of some governments is actually getting away from those kinds of fuels that can be shut down at any, any given minute. And this then produces a really compelling push, um, um, I guess a, a stronger push in a direction I think we're already heading. So these crises, what I would say is they, they do keep our minds on climate change because we're always thinking about climate change at this moment in a way that I think is very productive. Whether we're doing something about it in a substantive way is a different question. Sheena, do you want to jump in on that question? I guess I would also say, too, that if you think about... Um, extraction, these extractions that are happening, then COVID, for example, becomes a good example about how we can all take action on being less extractive, right? Instead of trying to, you know, at the beginning of COVID, there was a lull, then when this was going to be the way life was, well, then we really ramped up and everybody had to like now neoliberal perform and you didn't even have 10 minutes to walk between meetings or, you know, and we do these things to one another, there's nobody there's no like grand master making this happen. It's our own master narrative, right? About modernism and productivity that creates this. And so if we think about, you know, I won't use the example of the war in Ukraine, it's more complicated, but if we just think about COVID and how we adapted to COVID, 
Some ways in which we adapted to COVID reduced energy. Others are kind of false promises of reducing energy as Imra mentioned, right? Or even the idea that going all online is somehow not having an environmental impact. And I think it's also about those, you know, human energies and labors that technology is always supposed to replace the, the ever promise that never actualizes, right? And so we need to think about how we're doing these things to one another every day. We maintain these systems and we do them in small ways and we do them in huge ways, huge industrial ways that impact the climate on a global scale, but that we could change. It was an opportunity to change the way we lived. And in many ways, we found ways to adapt and be more of the same modern humans rather than taking up the challenge for change that you know, the pandemic proposed. So. Mm -hmm. Redundancies, <laughs> habits. <laughs> They're difficult to, to break and to break down. Here is another question for the both of you. Can you speak to some of the resources and tools that have been developed through the last 10 years? And what were some that you thought are the most exciting or that you're most proud to see? Do you want to start on that one, Sheena? Uh, that one is a tricky one. I wasn't expecting that question. What tools? Um, oof, what tools? I mean, we, we, we talked a bit about how we've tried to do academic life differently. I think the creation of a community was a really important thing. Some of, some of the things that we've done don't sound revolutionary, but in, in practice, if people just get together and think together and you know, disrupt ideas of single authored genius and realize that to solve these problems, we have to work collectively and together and nobody has the answers and anybody that promises they do is, you know, someone to be skeptical of. And so we really have to think together. So um, we've done a lot of that and uh, it's, it's hard work. It's hard work to think together. It's hard work to listen well. It takes time and we're in a time of urgency. We feel like we have to act urgently and yet we have to also act meaningfully and thoughtfully. So I guess those are just some quick reflections to a question I wasn't anticipating because we don't have a magic toolkit. Um, what, else have, what else have we done, Imran? Well, I would point to two things. Um, it has been always important for us to do academic work differently and to always do it in a way that's accessible to publics right away. So when we did that first after oil event, we not only invited a number of people to write a single book in a short amount of time, and that included individuals like the former liberal leader of, um, sorry, the, the liberal party in Alberta came to work with us. That wasn't like, what was the point of that project was not just to write a book together and publish it with an academic press. We actually self-published it we made a bunch of physical copies available. I think there were 2,000, maybe 3,000 physical copies have been distributed by all of the people inv involved in petrocultures. It's always been free online as well. You can go to the afteroil.ca website. And I think that's one of the, one, I would point to that in part because I come across that book and reference to that book all the time. People talk to me that they've, they've seen that book. It's had an impact on them. It's been easy to access. So that's, and not just in academic communities and other communities. I guess the other thing I would mention is a project that Sheena and others were involved in that uh, had to do with some work that we did with high schools, high schoolers around the world. Um, so we did a one-year project where we put together 20 schools from 16 countries, and we had an ongoing dialogue with um, groups of students from these schools about what exactly energy looks like in their countries. And so it wasn't, that discussion wasn't through us. We just made the conditions so those high schoolers could speak to one another and learn about their own situations and learn from one another about what they might do in their specific areas. And I'll just give one example, I think. Um, I could give lots of examples, but I re there's, a, there's a school in Costa Rica. They had a discussion, I think, with a school in Denmark about figuring out ways that they might go um, kind of net zero. And the school in Costa Rica said, we, we've already done that. Like it's completely, we have a solar panels on our building. 
um, you know, our school, we've already figured that out. And the, the high schoolers who were in the developed world or the more developed world were taken aback that elsewhere in the country, elsewhere in the world that they might not have expected to be as far along the path of renewables would have something to teach them um, that just the recognition of that meant a great deal. So that project is something that we are planning to do again, or we would hope to do again. Uh, that's one of the many projects that was sidelined by COVID. Um, and that's some, I would say that was led by one of our colleagues at the University of Alberta in the um, Faculty of Education. We would certainly draw on her expertise again. Great. So we have time for just one more quick question that I'd, I'd like to offer to the both of you. As scholars of petrocultures for over 10 years now, what keeps you hopeful for the future? Well, I'll just say this in brief. I feel that there are enormous changes that have been happening in relationship to um, energy, in relationships both to the physical apparatus of energy, the ability of renewables to produce a lot of energy with a limited amount of um, cost of to develop those technologies, but also simply in the discussion that we are having around the necessity of creating a renewable society. This is not something that existed five years ago, 10 years ago. It's just part of what is out there now. At the beginning of 2021 with the election of Joe Biden, uh, Bill McKibben said in, I think it was in the New Yorker, that the age of oil is over. And those kind of pronouncements can come back to bite you, um, especially given the kinds of things that are unfolding. But I think that's right. I don't think we're going to have a situation now where, despite pushback from, um, from oil companies, despite the very weak decisions by the Canadian federal government about the direction it's going on energy, despite those kinds of things, there's not going to be a situation when we're going to completely rely on, on fossil fuels. That really is over. And so what keeps me hopeful is to see what's actually determinately happening. Um, whether or not we ourselves are making that adaption, uh, you know, we're adapting to these new uh, renewables in the way that I think we've been talking about in petrocultures, that I think remains to be seen. But I think that discussion is going to come next in a substantive way. Let's hope that Bill is right. <laughs> Sheena, a really quick response about what keeps you hopeful, what keeps you going, what keeps you motivated? Well, I would say like Imra, it's kind of exciting when you say things and you remember 10 years ago, people really scoffing at things and now that vocabulary or those attitudes have become part of like, you know, policy meeting discussions and that kind of thing. And the other piece of it is that I don't feel hope, real, hopeful every day, right? It isn't always hopeful. But the one thing that does keep me going is all the community relationships and you know the connections and all the people that actually care and want to make this happen and the ways that um, on a local level people are working together to make a difference now whether it'll make a difference at the speed and pace that we need to address this problem is one thing but it does make the the everyday more livable and makes us all more resilient great Beautifully put, thank you both. Um, we're out of time for questions, but thank you to the audience for being here with us and for taking the time to think through this. And especially thank you to Dr. Imra Zeman and Sheena Wilson for this insightful discussion on petrocultures, reflections on 10 years of research and advocacy for a world in crisis. It's been such a pleasure to speak with the both of you and to join you for today's Big Thinking Lecture. On behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, thank you to the Big Thinking Series sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, Universities Canada, and the Canada Foundation for Innovation. If you would like to revisit today's presentation and this conversation, the video will be available on the Congress 2022 platform in the coming days. Today's lecture is the fourth and final Big Thinking event at Congress 2022. And I hope that you've enjoyed this year's series on the theme of transitions. As Congress continues, you can keep participating in the conversation on Twitter 
using the hashtags, hashtag big thinking and hashtag Congress. That's with an S at the end, Congress with an H, an H at the end. And thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the rest of Congress 2022 and that we'll see you again at Congress 2023. Be well, everybody.